Hey guys, this is Elise. Welcome back to this project, Catholic Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. Today, I would love to introduce to you one of my very good friends and one of the panelists, Andrew. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Elise. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so glad to have you. I love our conversations and I think it'll be a lot of fun to do this project together. So, hey, um, you know, in entering this conversation, um, I'd, I'd first like to ask you, what, what drew you? What, what got you interested in getting, in getting involved with this project? Well, I think there were a couple things. Um, one, you asked me and I have great respect <laughs> for you, so I wanted to say yes. Um, more broadly, uh, I think we are in a particular um, kind of Kairos moment in our nation around race. It's been building for years now, I think particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, as well as a variety of other social and political changes the country has gone through. Um, I hope in a lot of ways that we are entering a next civil rights era, if you will, in which we'll look back at this time and see positive progress towards equality and equity for all. Um, there definitely is a momentum, I think, that I feel in, the, in this kind of moment in history um, that I think demands a higher level of attention and participation from everyone involved. Um, whether you're a Catholic um, or not, whether you, wh whatever your race, ethnicity, gender, you know. Um, so I, I think that's kind of part of my motivation for speaking up now um, in a way that I haven't before. Um, I've remained silent, especially in Catholic circles around these kind of topics, um, unless I share them with other friends of color. Um, I think now, now is the acceptable time, if you will, to make our voices, to make our voices heard and to share what's going on. Um, and then I think just broadly, like the idea of intersectionality is something that I deeply um, care about and has very much shaped my life. Um, I was an ethnic studies uh, major in undergrad. Um, I've uh, gotten an ethic, ethics degree um, since then, a master's. And um, these topics around identity and um, how they intersect across, you know, different types of identity, whether it's gender or race, religion, class, uh, nationality, all these things are things I think I carry with me on a daily basis. So it feels just very natural for me to speak on it. It's something I quite enjoy speaking on, to be honest. That's wonderful. So, um, you know, as someone who is going to help model how to have these conversations, what do you hope that viewers as well as other panelists will get out of this experience? Well, I think, you know, just learning is always a good step, um, particularly, I think, for those of us who are part of the Catholic faith. Uh, part of being Catholic is being universal, being multi-ethnic, um, and genuinely listening to each other in, in our experiences. And particularly, I think it is the nature of our faith to be listening to those in the margins, those who've experienced oppression, those who've experienced marginalization, because not only did our Lord, when he was here on earth, inhabit those identities, he also made it a point to reach out to those people. So I think it's something that's very natural for our faith to do in terms of kind of our ethos, but it's also something that's like re required for us to do. Um, if we genuinely believe that all humans, you know, every person of um, every different ethnicity and race and gender is created truly in the image of God, then in some ways we can encounter God more fully as we encounter his different peoples, right? If we are excluding an entire race or ethnicity from our church, from our friendships, we are missing out on how God is manifested in our world through his creation, through other humans. Um, and I think for the church, it is a really sad idea. It's a really sad and really awful idea to think that we are missing out on part of um, God's plan for humanity when we exclude people of other races from our church, whether intentionally, unintentionally, whether um, individually, or whether because of the systems we've built that kind of uh, work to exclude certain types of people. So for me, it's not just kind of a moral imperative just as a good person, but as, um, as a Catholic, I think this is necessary for our faith. Totally makes sense. Yeah, so um, I really enjoy my friendship with you and I would like to help people get to know you a little bit, at least in this area. So um, to begin our conversation on your experiences, uh, could you share a moment with me that you first experienced racial identity, racial intersectionality in your life? 
Yeah, um, I know for myself, just in terms of like, identifying ethnically, I, I was I knew I was Indian from a very young age. Like I think by the age of three, you know, my parents had used the word. I was aware that I'm Indian, but also somehow American. That I live in Ohio, and you know, as a three year old, it's hard to make sense as to what all these things mean. Um, but I think it didn't really occur to me until first grade that there was this like significant difference in me being Indian compared to those around me. Um, so you know, in grade school, oftentimes you are you know, in one class with all the same students every year, right? So in kindergarten, you get used to all these other 20-something, 30-something students who are with you, and then you move on to first grade, and it's a whole new set of students, maybe <laughs> friends from before. It's a very anxiety-producing thing when you're a little, right? Um, <laughs> kindergarten, so I was, I was at the same school between kindergarten and first grade, um, and all through my grades brought, I, I, went, through a pri I went to a private Christian school. Um, my sister and I were pretty much the only Indian kids in the school, one of the few people of color in the entire school. Um, so in my class, I was the only Indian person. And I believe in kindergarten, there was maybe one other person of color who was a black, a black girl. Um, at that time, I remember I was, you know, quite light skinned. And most of the other students in my class who were white would use the color yellow to color the, their skin in. Um, I think probably out of the fact that, you know, just leaving the skin color white would be like very pale um, for how most of them looked. And this was a time in which, you know, we most, everyone had like the 12 pack of crayon. Some people, like the bougie ones had the 64 pack with a little like crayon sharpener built in. But that was, that was like if you were really cool, you know, and everyone wanted to be friends with you. Most of us only had the 12 pack. So if you have the 12 pack, what color matches, you know, white skin the most? Yellow, I guess, was the reason that they chose that. Um, and then I know that the one black girl in my class, she used the color brown to color herself in. For myself, being a relatively light-skinned, um, like, Indian person at that point in my life, I, I chose yellow as well, because I thought, you know, this, I mean, literally, I think I, I matched that color a little bit more than most of my white classmates did. Um, so that was my kindergarten experience. No problems there. First grade comes along, um, and I remember one day I'm coloring myself in, and a white classmate who was not originally in my kindergarten group, she was a new, new addition to the first grade class to me, um, she saw that I was using the color yellow to color myself in. And then she asked me why I was doing that. And I was just kind of like, I'm just coloring in, you know, the picture of myself that I was drawing, the picture of me and my family. And she said, you can't use that color. It's for white people only. Um, you have to use brown. And she handed me the brown crayon and took away the yellow crayon. Um, and I was a little bit confused because, you know, in my mind, this color brown was actually pretty close to my dad's skin color, but not close to mine. Um, and more broadly, I knew that other black students used the color brown to color themselves in. And I, at that point, knew that there was a difference between me and black people in the room. Um, I was also aware that there was a difference between me and the white folk, too. But I think for me, this was the kind of the first time in which there was a racial boundary erected that was kind of like, you cannot use this. This is for white people. You are not one of us. Um, so at that point, I think I had to go borrow another crayon from a friend who had the 64 pack and I was able to find a color that more matched my skin tone. So it was, it resolved itself within the day of, but I always remember that particular story of kind of feeling alienated from my class and kind of realizing that there's something different about me. Um, and unfortunately, I think if you ask most people of color in America what their first experience with race was in terms of realizing that they're different than maybe the white folk they see on TV, pretty much all of us have a story in which it's marked by feelings of exclusion, alienation, marginalization, um, being different, being outcast. And I think if you ask the same question for white folk, they probably usually don't have that kind of answer. Um, so to me, I think of that story, it's very innocuous, it's very innocent, if you can call it that in a way. Um, you know, just kids coloring pictures of themselves. It, it represents for me kind of a beginning of this thread that's, you know, colored my life. Um, in how racism is something that, you know, I, I carry with me every day in the daily interactions um, to just how I see myself and how I know others see myself. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, you mentioned something about the daily interaction. So after that first initial experience, could you say a little bit more about how your, your experiences as you developed and grew compounded on that initial first message? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, growing up in Ohio in the 90s, uh, it was not the most diverse place in the United States. And uh, definitely, I think the feelings of exclusion, of um, isolation continued throughout um, definitely like my 
kind of formative years of childhood and adolescence, um, manifesting sometimes in very innocuous ways, like I mentioned before, just kind of small interactions that are marked by ignorance or kind of intentional or unintentional othering um, that uh, can sound, that oftentimes kind of carry this weight of like, was this a racial thing? Looking back on this, what like, was this intentional because I was the only brown room person in the room or um, was it just something else? And I think that points to the fact that these are the burdens that people of color have to carry, right? That in, in many of our interactions, when we have these negative encounters where we are the only person of color in the room, that's a question that we always have to ask ourselves. What was it about me that caused this issue? Why didn't it happen to the white person sitting next to me? Is it a race thing? You know, the person now didn't call me a racist slur, so are they a racist? That's hard to know. But that's a burden that we have to carry as people of color that definitely leads to a low level of anxiety and stress that I think many of our white brothers and sisters do not have to worry about. Um, and then, of course, throughout my journey, I've also had specific negative encounters with people where race was in fact invoked, um, whether it was through slurs. Um, and, you know, I think particularly being Indian and um, being somebody who may be considered like racially ambiguous, it's been interesting for me because the slurs I've gotten or the kind of interactions I've had that are explicitly racist don't always match up with what my ethnic identity is, right? People may confuse me for another type of race and, um, you know, attack me in that way. Uh, which has been kind of an interesting and weird experience also. Um, but definitely through my journey from, you know, childhood to adulthood, racism has made itself known in my life, um, like I said, almost daily, um, whether I was aware of it at the time or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do you feel like, do you feel like these experiences are in particular sectors of your life that you've um, walked through, like social spheres of your life? Or do you find that it's emerging in multiple spheres of your life. And I, I ask this because like, you know, as your friend, I kind of know the answer, but also to like help introduce sure. you and help people to get to know you a little bit more. All spheres. Um, I think even if we want to talk about like, for example, in the space of my family and spaces where I'm with other Indian people, with other people who are the same ethnicity, race, what have you, racism still will appear in terms of the ways that we've internalized um, messages of white supremacy and anti-blackness, things like that. Um, but of course, I think even in multi-ethnic settings where I, I might be the only person in my race or one of a few, um, there are times in which racism does rear its ugly head. It reminds us, um, I think especially as brown people, that like you cannot just live your life in a, in a free and easy way. Um, it, it is here for us as sin is haunting us. I think of a specific story of um, attending a friend's wedding, a dear childhood friend, you know, from uh, my hometown, who's also Indian. She married a white guy. And after the, ch after the wedding, you know, we're outside this Catholic church, standing in front of the entrance, taking a huge group photo, um, as we're just, you know, trying to have our little celebration and, you know, celebrating this friend and, and their families. Um, a group of uh, white young men drive by and start yelling insults at us, specifically the brown people who are out there, racial insults. Um, and, you know, just in this moment of celebration, it can just completely deflate the whole experience because, um, you know, even as interracial relationships are such a controversial thing, um, you were just made aware of just like how big a deal it is. Um, for the white people, if this wedding was just a white couple getting married, this wouldn't have happened. Um, and I think that's a kind of like, no, no matter how much we progress as a society, no matter how many good, you know, accepting friends you have, when these things do happen, it just kind of reinforces those walls that do exist in our society to remind us that there are people who are out there who view us as less than human and are willing to denigrate us and, um, to even hurt us in that way. So I think that definitely all sectors of my life, um, it's raised its head. Um, and, you know, mentioning the church too, I, I think I'll, that's something that I do want to specifically talk about. I think for me as a South Asian person, as somebody who's Indian, I think that the Indian experience with Christianity has very much been marred by racism to the point, of course, where the majority of my people um, do not identify with the Christian faith. Um, or the Catholic faith, um, and in large part because there is a view that the religion is one of whiteness, that is one that is centered in a European Western experience and alien 
to a South Asian experience. And that is also something that is unfortunately perpetuated by many Christian organizations. Um, I think the great thing about being Catholic is I know that ultimately my church teaches that racism is wrong. And I would say from a church point of view, our teaching has always come down on the right side of that, of that argument, defending the rights of every person um, of every race. But unfortunately the lived experience for many of us has not shown us that that teaching has really been accepted by the faithful. Wow, those are a lot of heavy things. And I have a heavy question. <laughs> uh, do you feel like um, with racism, there are intersections where, how do I frame this? So in, in, this, in this conversation series, in this project that we're doing, we're trying to do intersectionality towards racial healing, towards racial reconciliation, towards racial justice. But within the framework and the, and the world of racism, do you feel like there is intersections of spiritual abuse with emotional abuse, with mental abuse, with relational abuse? Um, or systemic abuse. How do you feel about how do you feel about that interweaving? Everything you just mentioned, I would say yes, there is. Um, unfortunately, you know, even in our church, the Catholic Church, more broadly across Christian denominations, um, racism is very much tied to a variety of forms of abuse of people of color, um, and particularly, I you know, can, I can most prominently speak from my own experience as a as an Indian person. But um, as I kind of hinted at before, very much so I think that unfortunately the relationship that Christians have had with my, uh, with my race, with my ethnicity, Indian people, um, has been one that has been marred for too long by um, a relationship of uh, racial subjugation, of colonialism, of othering, um, to the detriment of our own salvation and the gifts that we would bring to the church. Um, so definitely this is an area where I know it's something that's very tied to my story of like faith and race. Um, and unfortunately, it's, even though I'm in a place where, you know, I am proud to be both Indian and Catholic and see those identities as fulfilling each other. Unfortunately, I think for many in the church, um, as much as they may affirm, you know, it's great that Andrew is Indian and Catholic. Um, I think that there's a lot of attitudes and behaviors that people have in the church that still reinforce the idea that people like me should not actually be fully welcomed as we are into the church, um, but rather asked to change and um, become more like people within the church uh, who, you know, uh, of people of their particular race, particularly usually like Europeans and um, Americans. And, and those kind of attitudes will, like I said, be to the detriment of the salvation of my people, um, as well as the um, benefit of people already in the church, right? Like I mentioned before, if you are missing any ethnicity in the church, you are missing out on the image of God revealed in humanity. If you do not have brown people in your church, you are missing out on a whole experience as to what the image of God means in the human form. And I think if you're missing out on that, you know, how can we call ourselves Catholic? That's a really, really beautiful intention and beautiful sharing. Andrew, thank you so much for sharing from your heart. I'm so excited to share more conversation with you and with our other friends. Um, so with that, we'll bring a closing to this intro video. Everyone, uh, please stay tuned for more conversation with Andrew, with our friends. And with that, we wish you God bless for your day. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.